What up y'all? I hope you are well. We're here for our Saturday night secret sermon. We back. Uh, last week I took a break. I filmed a bunch of our uh, 2024 predictions videos and I think I'd uploaded those last Saturday. And so by the time I'd gotten finished with those, I was just a burnt little piece of toast. I was uh, fried. Um, so yeah, I took took the took the rest of the night off, but we're back again uh, looking into the Gnostic Gospels. Um, so if you guys aren't familiar with this segment, this weekly segment, on Saturday nights we do this, uh, this series called Secret Teachings of Jesus where I go into the Gnostic Gospels, something that I've always just been curious about and wanted to read. And I pick out a portion that kind of stands out to me and then I read it right before I go on camera like once or twice through and then I start the video and then we read it together and I give you guys some downloads and insights that I'm getting off the cuff and yeah and it's just some good good fun times for all of us and just something that I was interested in so I'm not you know a theologian or anything by any means just a, a student of mysticism and Kabbalah and um, things like that. And I thought we'd share this together. And so I started in the Gnostic, uh, sorry, the Nag Hammadi scriptures. Currently we are in the Gospel of Philip. If you go over to my channel, um, Light Love Magic, you can find the Secret Teachings of Jesus playlist. And then if you go all the way back to the beginning, we've also covered uh, the Secret Book of James. James is in Jesus's brother. So that one was a really fun one. Okay. <clears throat> so tonight's portion, I know I say this every week, uh, but I think that this is going to be fairly straightforward and it's not going to be like a pretty, like some of them are really dense. Uh, but yeah, I think this one's going to be pretty straightforward tonight. So the portion is called, oh, and by the way, if you are here for the first time, uh, so part of the reason I do this on Saturday night after midnight is because I work and I get home and that's what I do after work, um, or after we go out after work sometimes. Uh, but there's this benefit of being awake after midnight and connecting with sacred texts. There's this like, like extra heightened energy this time of night. Midnight is this uh, sort of portal. So the veil is thin this time of night. We're at the end of one day and the beginning of the next. So, you know, in, in, in at noon, for instance, you know, we're at the end of the first half of the day and the beginning. But like the midnight, though, is like the, the turnover of a new day. So that has some, some uh, power in many magical traditions and systems. And so there's another thing. Um, so during the day, Kabbalistically speaking, each hour has um, like an energetic signature to it. And so at the beginning of the day, at that midnight hour, that's the beginning of the day. And so the, the light begins to grow at like in the early morning hours. It's like that's when the day is becoming. And so those early morning hours are the most positive hours of the day. Once you get to noon, that's like the culmination of the positive energy. And then in the afternoon, it's like the energy of the day starts to wane, especially as the sun goes down. So in the darker hours of the day, there are literally, it's like the darkness is like the the darkness darkness is is more you know prevalent and there's less light the light literal physical light is actually protective it's like an actual manifestation of the light of the creator um so yeah so at night there can be more chaos and negativity floating around and so when we are asleep our soul leaves our body and goes into this sort of miniature judgment day. It's like a mini death. And we go to like headquarters and you know, we kind of like do our rundown of the day. How'd we do, you know, we review our plays. <laughs> you, you could have done better here, all that. And it gives our soul like a cleansing like we do on Rosh Hashanah. 
So we are fairly vulnerable when our soul is away from our body. We are missing our surrounding light. The light of our soul is actually protective of us. So um, King David was actually not supposed to live after, I think he was supposed to die fairly young and he wasn't expected to live on after that age. And so he would get up in the, in the night and he would sleep in the early hours of the evening and he would get up for the late hours and he would study Torah. And it, when you talk about the creator, when you connect with the creator, um, especially when you're speaking out loud about the creator and declaring the creator's, creator's glory and your you know gratitude for the creator and his miracles and favor, you actually surround yourself in protective light and you draw greater vitality and blessing upon you when you do that. So it is like a, many of the sages and wise men uh, tend to study at this time of night because you are surrounded and protected um, by this particular kind of energy this time of day. All right, let's get into the business. So our portion tonight is coming from the Gospel of Philip and it is entitled, The Lost. <clears throat> and we begin. Those who have gone astray, who are offspring of the Spirit, go astray also because of the Spirit. Thus, from one Spirit the fire blazes, and the fire is extinguished. Let's read that again. Those who have gone astray, who are offspring of the Spirit, go astray also because of the Spirit. Thus, from one spirit, the fire blazes and the fire is extinguished. Okay, so our souls come to earth and they are incarnate and they go through the process of life. And then we die and we go up before the committee and they review the play <laughs> and then it, depending on where we're at within our soul's evolution in the previous life, we get our updated assignments and workbooks for the next incarnation to continue our work to develop our soul. And so we do this over a course of, you know, not just one lifetime, but multiple lifetimes. <clears throat> and so before we come to earth, we have in, in many spiritualities and religions and, uh, all kind like different uh, groups of thought, they generally tend to all agree on some form of like soul contracts, um, karma. In Hebrew, we use the term tikkun, and that's what we talk about in this channel, tikkun. And so I'm going to basically give you the rundown of this now because I feel like this is the central column of this portion. So our tikkun <coughs> is like Pretend like we're spirit souls coming in on a mission, right? Pretend like we're, I don't know if you guys saw the show, The Americans. It was amazing. It was about um, in the Cold War in 1980s, there were all these Russian spies in living in the U.S. Um, posing as Americans. And they were completely convincing. They had jobs and everything and, and they were spies. And so... Uh, the Americans is such a great show. I mean, it's one of the best main shows I've seen in my opinion, but I, I just found it really compelling how like Elizabeth and Philip are partners, they're spies and they are, um, they're married or they're posing as a married couple, but they actually have to live as a married couple. They're like in, a, in an arranged marriage kind of thing and they have kids and everything and the kids think they're Americans. They don't, they have no idea, right? So every day, Elizabeth and Philip have to figure out how to sneak away from their children and like go see their handler and get all the information from headquarters and their assignments, right? So that's kind of like us. We're here on earth and spirit is like our handler, our headquarters um, on behalf of the creator, uh, the Holy Spirit. And we are here as souls to play out these roles with one another in these groups. And we all kind of like figure out, okay, I need to fix 
I need to work on this. I need to bring this into balance. Um, and, and I'm stronger here where you're stronger there. So we're like, we're going to be in this paired up in this kind of relationship dynamic together, mother, daughter, um, boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, um, boss and employee, what, however it turns out. Right. <clears throat> and before we come here, we make major decisions of like where and how and who it's all going to play out. So we choose like who our parents are going to be, what city we'll be um, born in, uh, our strengths, our talents, our weaknesses, bullies, you know, major poignant relationships and friendships, college probably, like those major things in our life. We, they're already chosen. And it's not like we're put in this incubator like Barbie world where everything's perfect. Like if you guys haven't seen that, the movie, it is an amazing metaphor for everything that we talk about here. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it's not going to be perfect. Your mission is to grow, is to evolve. And evolution does not come from comfort. It comes from pressure and heat. And so you chose the most difficult things. We all did. And, uh, you know, the most difficult people and these ridiculous scenarios we find ourselves in. <laughs> it's like we probably thought up there, like, we're like, ha ha, it's going to be really funny, isn't it? And now we're on Earth and we're just like, stop buddy. Stop. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So... We, you know, we choose to live in places that are going to trigger our weaknesses and force us to develop strengths and talent and grit. And, you know, I mean, if you were watching a movie and everything was just handed to the character and nothing was complicated and they were just like, oh yeah, and everything just worked out. I mean, you'd be like, fuck you, Tom Brady. <laughs> nobody cares like you know just like boring like you know so it's like it, it gives us dimension it gives us character it gives us grit so we choose these challenges and we choose our parents and we choose you know the people that are going to be important to us and so there's this really helpful uh workshop exercise in one of the earlier kabbalahs it, i don't know if it's i don't think it's kabbalah one it might be kabbalah two or three but a question, these are two questions that I would sit with for two weeks. I would sit with the first question for a week, and then I would sit with the second question for a week. The first question or set of questions is, why did I choose my father? Three difficult reasons. Why did I choose my father? And what are three difficult reasons why my father choose, chose me? These aren't because, oh, my dad's so supportive and we get along and like we both love movies. This is, I chose a father who neglected me so that I could learn to be independent <clears throat> or learn to love myself deeper. You know what I mean? Like these are difficult, difficult things where you're like, you want to curse the man or curse the woman or whatever. Uh, but this is three difficult reasons again why I chose my father, if you were putting it into the context of how it's going to help your soul evolve, right? Push your soul to evolve, put the pressure on. This is all about the unfoldment of your greatest potential, right? To awaken your highest self. So uh, three difficult reasons why I chose my father and three difficult reasons why my father chose me. Week two. What are three difficult reasons I chose my mother? And what are three difficult reasons my mother chose me? Right? How have you been difficult for your mother, right? For your parents? Why am I, you know, the tie-dyed sheep of the family that didn't do something easy to digest? In fact, it's very difficult for, you know, my evangelical leaning parents to understand what I do on this channel you know uh, they're, they don't they just see the tarot aspect and their mind goes to all of the the generalizations right so they can't 
you know, they can't get it. Uh, but why, why am I not compliant? Right? Why am I not the, the, I mean, I've been the good daughter, but like they don't, I don't think they necessarily see it that way all the time. So it's like, why, you know, was I this way for them? Right? You, you can, I mean, I had a very, like I, my older brother struggled his whole life with drugs. Um, and, and there were a lot of layers, right? To that, uh, and to that origin story too. And so, you know, just thinking about this in terms of your siblings and your family, what they've been through, what your parents have been through with the, those siblings, you know, it kind of gives a di different context and it helps you let go of blame and feeling victimized. It feels like, oh, so when people say like everything happens for a reason, maybe that's a bit generalizing, but <clears throat> to say that everything happens for a purpose or anything can become purposeful if you choose to perceive it that way and and make it so. So back to Tiku. So there's these different governing forces within the human soul. It's time to deploy chart. Chart is here. So this is the tree of life. We've checked out this thing before and talked about it. These are the 10 dimensions of reality. Um, if you slow down and count, you will count 11. You will see that DOS or uh, DOS, dot, DOS is an unmanifest trait. It is not necessarily one of the dimensions. And so this is a map of God, the creator. This is the Godhead. So these are all the governing forces of nature and the reality. This is like a map or blueprint of the cosmos, of literally the blueprint of reality, the personality of God, the blueprint of the cosmos. This is also a map of the human soul. And so these dimensions of reality within the soul correspond to the dimensions of our consciousness. So we are bringing, when these things are in balance, they're in virtue, but when they're out of balance, there are vices, right? So on the right hand column, this is the column of the, the masculine energy. Um, the right hand column, it's positively charged. This is the column of mercy. The left hand column or the, the column of the feminine energy is the column of judgment. So the mercy is the blessing, right? The easy, you know, kind of things. And the judgment column is the more difficult, challenging aspects of life. And in order to bring these into balance, sometimes we have to go through the judgment um, in order to correct for or purify when, you know, our consciousness has become defiled by the ego or, you know, taken from its pure state and then put societal conditioning, limiting beliefs, fears, insecurities, all of those things like mess up your, your, your consciousness. So it's like we spend our lifetimes correcting the, the, the soul and we're looking to establish that central pillar, that central column. This is the column of balance of consistency, right? This is in electricity, you've got your positive, your negative, and your grounding, the neutral, right? So this is your neutral. This is also the column of consciousness, right? Um, these are kind of like archetypal, um, these are like archetypes, but this is the consciousness, right? And so these paths in between are the experiences that we archetypally go through as human beings all collectively as we face these different um, aspects of of the soul of life right of of our um, of our, our personalities throughout life as we awaken and we come into ourselves right so each of these paths is laden with experience that helps us bring these traits into balance. You know, we've got wisdom, understanding, judgment, mercy, uh, beauty, eternity, foundation, kingdom, reverberation. These are all words that, you, you know, we, we contemplate and, and uh, meditate on for a long time. 
order to understand what they mean. But in all of these dimensions, there are many associations, right? And so we'll just generalize them as virtues, right? And so when they're out of balance, they're in vice and we are in chaos, right? And we're, we're experiencing negativity. And so part of this life is that one of our, our reasons for being here is that we've got this density and this negativity that it is our assignment to transmute and transform and elevate this. And so there is like this light inside of us. Our spirit is pure source light, right? And it's radiating from within us. But as we leave our infancy, you know, when you look at a baby and you're just like, wow, you know where you just came from. Like you can see the wisdom and the, and the purity in their eyes and their connection. You can see their soul. It's amazing. But as their personality develops, they lose that pure trust, that vulnerability, and the mind gets in the way and they start building defense mechanisms, you know, to protect themselves from what they've been witnessing, right? Ooh, ooh, the world is not, I, I, whoa, I am more vulnerable than I even knew. Holy shit, half the time my school wasn't even developed yet and I've just been laying around trusting no one would have even fed me and I cried like oh my god so like right as we grow away from babies we forget that we that we're connected that we can trust that we can that we're these pure beings right and then we're made to feel shame and fear and insecurity and lack and so we start building these layers this these veils of forgetfulness of, of who we really are it's this conditioning that builds up and so through our lives, we begin to awaken at, at different ages, we get different levels of our soul. Uh, that's why children are bat mitzvahed and bar mitzvahed in Judaism. Uh, I don't know about in other beliefs, but I'm sure that that's probably a similar, I feel like everybody's, you know, on a similar thing. So children, um, girls at the age of 12, boys at the age of 13, receive the next level of their soul. Uh, the, I can't, I, I can't remember the Hebrew words for each level of the soul and know that I'm getting them right. So I'm not going to say it, but I think it's the next I don't know. <laughs> don't, don't, don't repeat me. So yeah, we get this, the next layer of our soul when we're in, you know, 13, 12, and that is where we're starting to be able to be accountable for ourselves. We get another layer of le level of the soul, uh, I think when we reach like 20 or so, something like that, like when we're out of our parents' tikkun, right? When we are no longer like under their, like they're not responsible for us anymore. We're our own adults. We have our own aut autonomy and our parents' actions are no longer affecting us as far as like we're being punished for their choices anymore. So... Different times of life, we're getting different levels of our soul. And so we're going through these different tests and challenges. And so the purpose of, you know, our path is not really to find that perfect career that helps us share our gifts with the world. It's actually our greatest purpose is to transmute the darkness that we're carrying within us. That's basically our rent for being here on earth. It's like the whole reason we're here. It's the whole reason we have an earth. We built an earth for you. And it's the thing that gives us our our ticket in is our imperfection. Isn't that great? We bemoan it, we hate it. We're like, oh my God, we're so shameful. It's not true. It's the it's our blessing. It's our reason for being in the physical world. If we had no flaws, we wouldn't even have a whole we wouldn't have a physical world. Right? So we don't have to, you know, curse them. We are here to transmute them though. So when you think about physics, the law of conservation of matter states that matter cannot, can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be transmuted. And that's the same with like negativity and density and evil in the world and darkness. It can't be destroyed. There would be a paradox or create like a vacuum because this existence needs all the stuff that's in it or else it will implode. 
So it can't be obliterated. It has its place here. So it has to be transmuted. And the most amazing thing is, is that when you elevate those parts of your soul, when you change something in your ego, when you change something in you that was selfish and it becomes more sharing, uh, when you forgive someone of something that hurt so bad and it would have been a grudge that would have caused separation, like that is a moment of transmutation. We are transforming the dark into light. And you know, it's like if we heal our anger, right? And our bitterness, that it's, we're elevating the upper realms, right? And it's not only, it's like, it's, you're taking darkness that would have been forever perpetuated as more darkness and chaos in the cosmos. And you are taking that and you are changing it to light, right? When you took that bitterness and you changed it, that means that you're not going to be spreading that out into the world anymore. It's you put an end to it. You've 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 changed it and you've transmuted it into something that gives you a more complex depth of compassion for others, right? Or like you understand them on a different level and maybe it's given you more patience. And so it's forever changed into something positive. So our flaws are our assignments, right? And they're our ticket for being on earth. And so that's why we're here. So let's go back and read the portion again. The lost. Those who have gone astray, who are offspring of the spirit, go astray also because of the spirit. Thus from one spirit, the fire blazes and the fire is extinguished. So... Tikkun. We have these assignments, right? We've got our parents assigned to us, where we're growing up, all of these things are going to play out. Now, I love using the example or the metaphor of the show Curb Your Enthusiasm. I don't know if you guys have seen this show. It's one of my favorite comedy shows that of, of history, <laughs> but it's an HBO show. And this show is the creator of Seinfeld, Larry David, basically wrote Seinfeld and a lot of it was based on his life and his friends and some of it is, you know, is kind of true. So Curb Your Enthusiasm, it's very meta. It's like Curb Your Enthusiasm is a show about the, the writer creator of Seinfeld, Larry David. And so Seinfeld is a show that was scripted in the 90s and it's kind of supposed to be what Curb your enthusiasm is. <laughs> it's very meta. It's like this. Okay, so the show Seinfeld is like Sein, Jerry Seinfeld is like uh, Larry David. He's supposed to be Larry David. And so now in this show, Larry David is playing Larry David, but you're seeing all the scenarios that Larry David gets in that made for the episode material in Seinfeld. So the structure of Curb Your Enthusiasm is Larry David, the writer, is playing himself and all of these like actors in Hollywood are playing themselves and they're like part of Larry David's community. And this is mockumentary, it's mock reality. So because they all actually know each other and they're all, fr they're all friends, it, f it feels real, but it's not. It's like all made up scenarios, they're all fictitious. But these are real people playing themselves put into hypothetical, like fake, fictitious scenarios. And so the beauty of the show is that they outline this, the episodes and the scenes, but they're improv improvised. All the dialogue is like made up on the spot, like in the moment as they film. They have the blocking all worked out. They know how the scene's going to play out, but like they're kind, they're, they're off the cuff. And so that's basically what life is. We are like the actors in Curb Your Enthusiasm. And so we are playing out these roles in life, right? We're like, we're really souls and we're like, hey, I'm gonna go put on my Liz outfit, I'm gonna be Liz. 
<laughs> we're all gonna play out these parts and it's gonna be real real um we're getting really into it <laughs> and then afterwards we're all gonna die we're gonna have it we're gonna like feast on carbs and not get any weight okay and so we're here and there is sort of an outline to a script of our life that's ready to go with plot points intel and basically an outline and that is called our fate Fate is the hand that we are dealt with our tikkun. Here you go. Here's your soul. Here are your assignments. <laughs> Here's a water bottle. I hope you do good down there. Keep your chin up. <laughs> Tie your shoes. <laughs> you great. Okay, so we're here. We have our little lunchbox. We're ready to live now. <laughs> and so there are certain things that are like, like planned that are going to happen and this is faded and there's n the, nothing about it is, avo is avoidable. There are contracts and no matter how hard you try to avoid it, it's like you are in that contract and it is going to play out and you need to learn certain lessons from it. That's why certain things keep circling around and there's like something that you still haven't gotten from the situation or something that hasn't been fully evolved within yourself or there's some reason why you haven't been able maybe the thing is that you're not supposed to go back into the situation keep going back to the situation right but either way certain things in this life are fated to happen to us that is our fate destiny is what we choose to do with the fate once it's presented right destiny is the life that we are creating in the moment with our free will. Now, free will is something that we all think that we can use and we're using all the time, but really we aren't. I like am just now like getting to the point where it's possible that I have started to use free will. And this is what I mean. Most of the time we go through life and we are in effect consciousness. There is a lot of ways that Kabbalah breaks down consciousness in pairs of du dual duality. Cause consciousness versus effect consciousness. In order to have affinity with the light, we need to be in a state of cause consciousness, not effect consciousness. The light, the creator, that consciousness um, gathered and intended for there to be light and said let there be light and then there was a big bang and the universe was created and creation was created and and that that was the cause and so all of of creation and humanity and reality is the effect of the cause of the creator so it is our nature to be affected by things but as we awaken and we come online and we're like, oh, I'm not just an animalistic human being anymore. I am going to actually start to, I'm, I'm awakening. I am now taking on the yolk of my soul's tikkun. I'm doing this by choice and I'm aware of what's happening now. I'm awake. I'm awake. I know what's happening. I know we're in a simulation. <laughs> and the rules. Okay, it's, it's on. It's game on. Oh my God. Immediate challenge. Immediate opponent. Um, okay. And so it's like, you're going to start, you're, you're involved now. <clears throat> so cause consciousness is when we are certain within the creator and we can maintain our consciousness and our vibration and our emotional state. And we're not triggered by the changing circumstances around us. And we're not made fearful by the circumstances and we're not um, falling into despair and we're not losing hope. We are choosing whatever we choose. But if we are triggered, default setting, react mode, oh, how dare you say that to me? Oh, they cut me off. Oh, I'm so scared about this bill that came in. Oh, I'm going to feel sick. <laughs> I'm going to go throw up. Like this is being in effect consciousness. So it takes practice. It takes devotion. It's part of a discipline, right? To realize when you're in when you're in an effect consciousness state, and to build the certainty and the prayer practice and the relationship with the Creator to start understanding. Oh, you start to see through the simulation, and when you start to understand how the pieces are fitting together, 
you build more certainty because you're like, oh, hold on. I know the creator is involved in everything. <laughs> I just need to activate the creator. This is all playing out for my tycoon. So if things are shitty and they're coming at me and it's like, oh my God, there's chaos going on right now. It's like, there's a part of it that's like, okay, that's, this is part of my tycoon. So I can actually embrace this and work with it, not let it affect me, actually let it affect me in a positive way where I am looking and I'm like, okay, why is this in my movie? Creator sent, if, if creator allowed this to happen, uh, how is it serving the evolution of my soul or how could it? How could it serve the evolution of my soul? Because basically what's happening is that we are, when we awaken, we realize, oh, I'm in a simulation and there is, I'm trying to get to a goal where my soul is progressing towards its ultimate fulfillment and purpose. And I have an opponent that's actually coming to try to stop me from achieving that goal. And actually the purpose of the opponent is actually to get me even further and make me achieve my potential. But it's the nemesis, the nemesis that pushes you, that makes you stronger, that makes you more determined, that makes you, gives you more grit, that earns you the points, right? The hero isn't the hero without the challenger, right? So the opponent comes and throws all the chaos at us, right? God, God's not gonna cause chaos. That's not what the creator is. Creator doesn't have any affinity with chaos, but the creator has this opponent here on earth and it serves a purpose. And so even the things like pain can help us correct our tikkun. Um, if we have put a bunch of negativity out in the world, then we are earning judgment, right? We are putting negativity onto that negative side of the scale. See my scales back here? And so we're going to have to transmute and transform that negativity to get that on the back of the positive scale again. And how do we do that? What changes that negativity? Well, we can be proactive about it and we can consciously transform it but sometimes we're not that on top of it. And so sometimes it takes life's difficulties to get our attention or to soften us in an area or to teach us a, a level of understanding something, to make us wiser or stronger or give us skills in the ways that we wouldn't have without that experience. So let's read this passage again. Those who have gone astray, who are offspring of the spirit, go astray also because of the spirit. Thus, from one spirit, the fire blazes and the fire is extinguished. So, as we are presented with things and we can figure out, okay, I want to be in a cause consciousness mindset instead of effect consciousness. And we're no longer going through life as the complete victim of circumstance. And we're like, oh, okay, there is a purpose for everything that's happening to me. Uh, there is, you know, a reason for things going on. And the thing that we use at the Kabbalah Center is pause. Don't do anything. This is the, the don't react moment. I'm triggered. Pause. What a pleasure. Isn't this nice? I get to see this. This is an, this is an assignment offered to me and I can earn points right now. If I break this shell of negativity, I will reveal more light and I will tip the scales. So pause. What a pleasure, not doing anything, not doing anything. Why is this in my movie? Why is this scenario playing out? If this is happening for me and not to me, what is this trying to teach me? What is this trying to show me that I can change in myself, right? Always ask, what is it about myself that I can change? Not others, their stuff is on them. It's not to say that a person doing something wrong to you in a situation is justified or right. They're gonna have to pay for their deed. They're gonna have to work it off in their tycoon. But you guys were sole contracted, and so you probably had equal uh, debt. <laughs> and so, you know, it's a trade-off, right? The, sometimes the, the mistakes that we make they were planned and they were part of scenes that were already written out for someone else's tikkun and for our tikkun. But we, we still have to be remorseful for those things, right? We still have to answer for those mistakes that we made. 
But the positive thing is, is that we don't have to feel shame and hate ourselves and think we're awful and we're evil and we're despicable because of them. That is actually, okay, so their opponent has, there's a masculine opponent and a feminine opponent. The masculine Satan, uh, he is the one that comes first and trips us up with the trick. It might be temptation into grandiosity or lust or, you know, you know, appetites, power, um, you know, it might be anger, whatever, but he'll tempt you into doing the action, making the mistake. The feminine Satan comes in and she makes you feel like shit. She doesn't, she affects how you feel about yourself on the inside. Masculine Satan affects how you behave, but feminine Satan affects how you feel. The masculine Satan does take his points from you. It's like that energy, the light, the light that we're gathering in our vessel, the surra same surrounding light from the soul that protects us, right? That strength. It's like, I don't know, think about yourself as like a video game character and your power is up, right? And when you make these mistakes, it spills out of your vessel and the Satan comes and grabs it. <laughs> I got you. I got you. I got you to do something. I got you to do a sin. I got you to do a bad thing. And so then you're like, oh man, pause. What a pleasure. Why is this in my movie? You know what? I shouldn't have done that. I'm going to learn from that. That doesn't make me feel good. It's not, you know, it's not a good thing to do. It's not a good, it's not, it's negative towards others. It was selfish and it's destructive. So I am going to make an effort to change and I'm going to try not to do that again. I'm going to pray for the creator to help me not do that again. And I'm going to make amends and I'm sorry. Finished. Done. Now, however, if you went the other way and you were like, oh man, how could I have done this? I'm such a piece of shit. I will never forgive myself. Oh, oh. And you tear yourself about, tear yourself up about it. Like, oh, I'm worrying about the consequences. Oh, how is this person? Oh my God, they're never going to forgive me. It's like when you start beating yourself up and you start shaming yourself, you feel bad about yourself. That's the feminine Satan. And she takes double the points. She makes you fall even further. So it's not the fall, like the fall, the initial fall many times was already set up. It doesn't count though, if you're like, ooh, I'm gonna go do a bad action and I'm gonna justify it and I'm gonna lie to myself and I'm gonna say it was always supposed to happen, it was meant to be, and then if I can turn it around into a positive, then I get extra points, like, because this is the thing. If you can take your mistake and shift it into something that turns around and reveals more light of the creator. If you can, you know, forgive, if you can, if it, you know, you can turn it around and it can make a positive change, then it's like almost like you reveal more light again, right? And, but you can't do it on purpose. You can't set yourself up with a mistake, a fall, and then not beat yourself up about it and then turn it in, tur turn it around into a positive and then be like, all right, now that counts. I just worked off some of my tycoon. It has to be an accident. It has to be an innocent mistake or even like a temptation that you get tempted into and you're like, you, you feel real remorse, right? So those who have gone astray, who are offspring of the spirit, go astray also because of the spirit. So when we're offspring of the spirit, we're, we're children of the spirit. We're all children of the spirit. But when we decide, hey, I'm going to take my tikkun on and I'm going to have sovereignty and I'm not going to go around in, in, through life just being in constant state of reaction. I'm going to rise above this. I'm going to evolve. And I'm creator's going to help me do this, right? I'm going to, you know, with Jesus' help, right, rise in my Christ consciousness but uh, I'm not going to stay in the state of animalistic humanism. I'm going to rise above that and become my divine human being self. Uh, and so we have to go on a path of challenge. And, you know, it's like the hero's journey. It's grand adventure through life. But there's a there's process. So, you know, we, we learn to build the vessel and we become a greater vessel of sharing 
a greater vessel of sharing the light of the creator. And so we restrict the desire to in receive instant gratification and receive uh, for the self alone. And instead we build a vessel that can, you know, um, restrict and hold out for long-term value and fulfillment and become a vessel of sharing and, you know, giving to others and actually being a person who's doing the spiritual work, not just to relieve your own, you know, suffering, but, but to be, to shine more light into the world, to be the change that you wish to see, to be better so that you can make the world around you a better place. That's the real, like, that's the real magic sauce. If you're in, you know, on the spiritual path, great. You know, for whatever reason, it's great that you're here. But if you're actually here for more than just to alleviate your own suffering, and it's actually to hopefully bring more light into the world to help fight darkness and to make the world a better place, then you're, you're elevating the upper realms and the upper realms are thanking you. So let's read this one more time. So even the mistakes that you've made, sometimes the spirit has set those situations in your path and they, they're plot points on your story, but it's how you navigate those things that makes a big difference. And, and it doesn't mean they're not tests and it doesn't mean they're not mistakes that you have to answer for. You know, you always have free will, right? So maybe you were brought to that scenario and you could have bypassed the whole thing. You could have been like, no, you know what? I don't need this lesson, right? Boom, like instant beat the game, right? Uh, but most of the time we find ourselves, we're, we're all human, right? So we find ourselves going through the process and sometimes in cycles and cycles until we can finally break patterns. And sometimes once we got into a certain level of discernment and with and wisdom and experience, it's like a lesson presents itself again and we recognize it as a test and we're like, Oh, I don't think I need to do that again. <laughs> I think, I don't think I need that lesson. Right? So, you know, we, we grow over time and it's, it's not, a done one and done, you know, it's a process that's lifelong and they're the only finish line is to be dead, right? When we perfect our entire tikkun and you know, we have no more personality flaws, there's no purpose for us to be on earth anymore. Right? So never, you know, we, we can stop being so shameful and hard on ourselves and carrying around that guilt, right? It, it, it's, we're here to be imperfect, perfectly imperfect. And it's all about a journey of becoming and blossoming and unfolding into our greatest fulfillment and to our greatest potential. And if it was just the snap of a finger and we were already perfect, where would the, where would the, the depth be in that? Where would the, the fun be in that, right? So, yeah, we're here. We're allowed to, to be flawed. Those who have gone astray, who are offspring of the spirit, go astray also because of the spirit. Thus from one spirit, the fire blazes and the fire is extinguished. Now don't go out there like a big free for all because you're going to be racking up a bunch of spiritual credit card debt. Okay. Remember, everything, all of our actions that we take, we are accountable for. It puts it on that scale. Are you, did you do a positive action or a negative action? You have a scale in your life that is, you know, you're constantly affecting. You know, when we do positive actions, when we share, our, our positive side gets heavier. You know, um, when we create negativity in the world, the negativity side gets heavier. And sometimes in order to work off more of our negativity, we, and we're not doing, you know, there's not enough positive action we can do to keep up. You know, sometimes the universe sends you difficult processes, right? When you go through chaos and difficulty and challenge that works off some of that because you're changing in the process, right? Um, also physical illness, uh, physical pain, discomfort, um, public humiliation is a great one. <laughs> You can really be like, oh my God, I was so embarrassed. This is great. I worked off so much negativity. I don't have to go through some hard process now. Um, yeah, people talking bad about you. If you don't get upset 
and you don't say anything bad about them and you're just like, oh, yes, this is taking off points for me. Then they take actually take your sukun. They they not only like move your scale back to the good, but they actually have to take some of your like coal, some of your lumps of coal onto theirs, right? So that gives you even more incentive not to evil talk, not to talk about anybody. Oh my god, we're at 50 minutes. I just looked at my time, my time to, uh, stamp. Oh my god. See, I was gonna try to get us out of here <laughs> in under 45 minutes, and it didn't happen. We had three sentences. Okay, last time we're reading this. The lost. Those who have gone astray, who are offspring of the spirit, go astray also because of the spirit. Thus, from one spirit, the fire blazes and the fire is extinguished. All right, y'all. Um, yeah, and I mean, the fire blazes. We are burning off that negativity and revealing the blazing fire of the light within and you know the infernal fires of our negativity are being extinguished and yeah all right well i hope y'all have a good week this is packed with so many deep secrets from kabbalah and all so i hope that you um you get to see this whole video and it's not too dense but there's there's a lot of good stuff in here so sorry it went on long but it's a goodie you can always break it up and watch it different times. All right, y'all. Ciao.